Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today I'm going to talk about why when you read current superhero comics, you actually feel like you're reading about a villain instead of a hero. Because I ran across another Marvel podcast. It is a Women of Marvel podcast where they talk about why they write characters the way that they do. And so instead of speculating this time about why they write characters as villains, I'm going to give you right from the horse's mouth why they write characters as villains. And in order to do that, first I'm going to have to look at heroes as opposed to the way these people write villains. But even before I do that, I'll give you a little bit of what this podcast is about. Now, this podcast is, again, a Women of Marvel podcast where they have three women who are working for Marvel as writers, and you have the two interviewers, one of them being Sana Aminat, who is the second-in-command at Marvel Comics, and she is the vice president of content for Marvel Comics, and she is saying in this podcast that these three women that they are talking to, they are the future up-and-comers of Marvel writers. And briefly, their names are Leah Williams, Teeny Howard, and Vita Ayala. And I'll probably do another podcast about these three creators themselves and what they say. But today I'm going to talk about their idea of what a good character looks like. Now, this podcast itself is Marvel's celebration of Pride Month. And I think that is exactly why they are speaking so freely about what kind of characters they're actually writing. Now, first off, I'll have to qualify a couple of things before I start. When they are talking about Pride in this podcast, and they're talking about Pride Month, they don't just limit it, it seems, to sexuality. They also stick in gender and race at the same time. Because almost always when they talk about one, they talk about the other. They always talk about, I am a woman of X gender and Y race and Z sexuality. That's what they talk about. And they talk about pride in all of these things. Now, I'll have to say that if you want to take a look at any or all of those things together and really take a objective look at them and say, OK, I want to understand what these things are. I want to understand how they affect me. I want to understand the good parts and the bad parts of all of these things. Sure, no problem. You go ahead and do that. I got no problem with that at all. What I have a problem with is pride. Because what I just talked about, you understanding those things, is something that is objective. But pride is something that is subjective. It is something that has to do with feelings. You are subjecting things to your feelings. And as I said, if you want to look at all of those things, your gender, your race, your sexuality, and understand them, and bring that understanding into how you live your life, sure, go ahead. But pride is where you have a problem, because we are talking again here about heroes. Now let's look at how that affects a hero. Because, as I always say, a hero for the last 3,000 years of Western civilization is a paragon of virtue. And those virtues have been set down for at least 2,400 years as prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Those are the main four categories that they go under, and they go successively. You have to have prudence first, which is good decision making, and then you can move down to justice. You can be a just person and render to everyone what is their due. And once you have justice, then you can be courageous. That is to say, you can have the fortitude to live out all of those prudent decisions that you've made, to live out being just, all of that. It all proceeds from being prudent, which again is good decision making. But the thing is that in order to have prudence, first you got to have right reason. That is to say, you have to look at everything objectively and rationally. You have to look at the world around you, not just rationally, but in accord with what reality tells you. That is to say, you have to look at both yourself and the world around you and look at the limitations of all of those things and say, yes, this is what it is, and this is what I am, and this is what reality is, and this is how all of those things express themselves and come together. You have to look at all those things objectively, how they are. And so it goes that when you look at reality objectively, then you can have right reason. When you have right reason, then you can have prudence. When you have prudence, you can have the rest of the virtues. When you have those virtues, then you can be a hero. So if you don't have this ability to look at things objectively, it destroys the idea of being a hero. It destroys hero itself. And what have always been the things that have been opposed to these virtues, that have been opposed to the ability to become a hero? Well, 
the opposite of a virtue is a vice. And the greatest of all vices, again, for thousands of years, not just in Christian culture, but also in Greek culture as well, is pride. Pride is an excessive love of yourself. It has to do with excess, an excessive love of yourself. So it's a feeling, and you attribute to yourself all these things which you don't actually have because you're attributing, first of all, to yourself this excess because you love yourself just a little too much. And as I said, you can go back to the Greeks, you can go back to Plato. He talks about this excessive self-love and how it is the root of all evil and how it destroys these ideas like heroes. And yet you have all of these women and all of these people, I would say, that work at Marvel, and yet they are celebrating pride. Again, if you want to take these things and look at them objectively, how they actually are, and see what they do to impact your life, you go right ahead. But the moment you stick them in as pride and have pride about them, you are doing something that destroys the idea of hero. Because what these people are doing by putting pride over top of everything is they are looking at the world subjectively, not objectively. They are looking at the world through this excessive love of themselves. And when you look at something subjectively, well, you're looking at the world and you're defining the world according to what you think. That is to say, your opinion. You're looking at the world according to what you like. That is to say, your mood. Or you're defining the world according to how you feel. And this is exactly why pride has always been seen as the destruction of the virtues, and therefore the destruction of the idea of hero. Because you're looking at the world through these subjective ideas of how you think, how you feel, what you like. All of these things is how you define the world. You are subjecting the world to how you feel and what you like and what you think, rather than looking at it objectively. And this, by the way, also destroys the fundamental basis of what a story is. Because, again, let's go back to Aristotle and his definition that has been around for 2,400 years, talking about how a story is constructed and why a story is constructed this way and why we love stories so much. He talks about the fact that a story is a representation of reality. And the better that story represents reality, the better that story is. And the reason why we love stories is because we, as human beings, we are imitative learners. From the time we were tiny little children, we learned through imitation. And that imitative learning when we were little children was called play. And so today, when we are adults, we take these stories, which are a representation of reality, and we learn from those representations of reality in a way that harkens back to that childlike play. And so it becomes fun to us, and we love these stories. Because, of course, this is an imitation. This story is supposed to be an imitation of reality. And so we're dealing with imitative discovery of things. And that's the way a story is supposed to be constructed. But of course, when you look at these types of writers, when they are taking pride and putting it at the center, they are not looking at the world according to how it actually is, nor are they trying to represent the world in their story, not how it actually is. They are trying to represent the world through these subjective feelings, through these subjective thoughts, through these subjective moods. The version of the world that they give to you is subjective. They are subjecting this version of reality to how they think, how they feel what their mood is. And to get back to this podcast that I'm supposed to be talking about, they mention this over and over again in this podcast in different ways. All of these different writers give it a different tag. One of them calls it lensing. Another one calls it a series of mirrors. Another one calls it point of view. Another one calls it perspectivism. That's what they're doing. They're taking these lenses of their sexuality, of their race, of their gender, and they're filtering everything through it. So that's the story that you see when it comes out. And you have one of these writers, Teeny Howard. She is writing Thanos right now. And she even goes so far as to say that for a week a month, when her book of Thanos comes out every month, Thanos is a woman of X gender and Y race and Z sexuality. That's who Thanos is every time she writes him, because Thanos is her. And she states this flat out. She is putting Thanos through these lenses of her own subjective personality, and that's who Thanos becomes for a week a month. And by the way, very quickly, I want to say that they also talk about in this podcast the fact that 
all of these creators, they used subtext. They don't put themselves directly onto these characters so that it becomes obvious, and they use that word. No, we don't do it obviously. No, they use subtext. They say, well, we've been trained since we were little kids because of our race, because of our gender, because of our sexuality. We've been trained to see subtext, and therefore this is how we tell stories. We put ourselves on top of everything, not just the characters, but the world itself. But we always do it subtextually so that people don't really see it. And they always try to put a positive spin on everything that they say. They say, no, we do that because we don't want to write obvious stories. We want to write complicated stories. That's why we're putting all of this subtext in. But to get to the heart of the point, to look at how these writers are actually writing villains instead of heroes, first I'm going to give you a quote from this podcast. And after I read this quote, then I'll go into exactly why these people are writing villains. Now here's the quote. You have the three of them talking. And what they're talking about is the comic characters that they themselves identify with. And one of them says, I identify with villains. And another one responds by saying, it's all that we got. And then the conversation proceeds this way. One of them says, I feel that we identify with villains because of their struggle. Very rarely today do you have a villain that is just cookie cutter. It's like, oh, you were traumatized and abused. And you were like, I'm going to reflect that back. And then she mumbles for a second and says, oh, I would never do that, but I feel that real deep. It would be a catharsis. So she's talking about this villainous behavior as being a catharsis. She herself feels this villainous behavior and that she would like to reflect all of this back at others. And then the conversation goes like this. Another one of them says, we find something instantly recognizable in these characters. And she is talking about villains specifically. She says that villains specifically, and then says they are misunderstood by everyone around them. Even if we don't consciously know why we're drawn to these characters, it's kind of an experience that's recognizable. And then another one of the writers says, and for a long time too, with villain characters, just in general, not specific to Marvel, they also had a lot of room not just to do things. They were a little more nuanced and complicated than the cookie cutter hero characters because you get all this pressure for the hero to kind of stay in one lane because that's the moral character and the moral center of the story. Whereas with the villain, it's like, no, you could have moments of softness and moments of doubt in all of these things, and then you're still the villain. And then she caps off the conversation by saying this, I would rather see that story than the one where the person is like, hi, I'm the good person, and that's it. I'm going to punch the bad guy. So what they are saying within these quotes, what these three authors for Marvel, these up-and-comers for Marvel, are talking about is the fact that they identify more with the villains than with the heroes. They don't like the heroes because the heroes seem to be constrained by their morality and being the center of morality in the story. No, they want to write these complicated, nuanced stories. That is to say, these stories about themselves in the subtext because they think that the villain actually has more freedom than the hero does. And of course, only people who are concentrating on pride would see this. Because sure, if you look at things objectively, if you look at things through right reason, you will say to yourself, I want to look at the world and myself and my place in the world objectively. Then you have to recognize not only the limitations of the world, but your limitations and your limitations in the world as well. But with pride, you just throw all that out the window. You don't recognize any of your limitations at all. But the thing is that when you try to act within reality, since you're not acting in accord with reality, everything that you do turns out wrong. Because reality is going to smack you in the face when you try to act in a way that's contrary to reality. And so when you make all of these prideful decisions, well, what happens? Well, you get pain, you get suffering, you get destruction. But of course, they think people are freer when they don't have to be limited by these virtues, by these ideas of morality, because these limitations do indeed tell you what exactly you can do in life. They give you instructions about how far you can go in life, because you have limitations. But they think to themselves, no, ignoring all of those limitations will make you freer. When the fact is, it doesn't make you freer because all of your decisions turn out poorly and it leads to destruction, it leads to suffering, it leads to pain. And this is exactly why these people are writing villains instead of heroes. Because, of course, they don't look at the world objectively. They look at the world subjectively, according to this pride. 
this subjective pride. That's what they filter the entire story through. And what does a villain try to do? Well, a villain tries to subject the world, or at least part of the world, to his will. And that's exactly what you do when you look at the world subjectively. You are trying to subject, to subjugate the world to your will, to how you feel, to what you like, to what you think personally. And of course, if we look at traditional stories and see what happens when a villain tries to act that way, what does it lead to? Well, it leads to pain. It leads to suffering. It leads to destruction. And so these writers, in subjecting this world that they show you, in subjecting these characters to who they are, or in filtering the world through, as they say, these lenses, these mirrors, these points of view, they're not actually showing you a correct representation of reality. They're showing you a representation of reality according to their own subjective perspective. They are subjugating this world themselves. And since they are doing that to this world themselves, there's no wonder that they identify with villains. Because these people themselves, in acting this way, they themselves are villains. I agree with Richard over at Comics Matter. He says that he's been in war zones, he's fought the Taliban, he's taken these people prisoner, and these people, these terrorists that they fought in the Middle East, they were not as bad a people as these people you see running comic books. These people running comic books are villains. They are trying to subjugate the world by looking at everything subjectively, their own personal subjugation of the world through their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions. And this destroys the idea of hero. This destroys the idea of a good story. And there's two really insidious things that come along with this. They are presenting to you a villain. But the thing is that they're presenting you a villain in the guise of being a hero. And why are they doing this? Why are they presenting these things this way? Because, of course, they want you to identify with these characters. There's a whole section in this podcast and a number of others that I could quote where they talk about empathy, where everything in the story is tied to the reader through empathy. Not through a correct representation of reality. No, through empathy. You have to feel what they feel in order to understand the story at all. But, of course, as we've seen, these people themselves and the representation of themselves that they put down on the page that's a villain. And since they want you to feel exactly what they feel, the really, really insidious thing about it is the fact that in writing these stories, they're trying to make you, the reader, a villain as well. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.